today, Neil Thurman, Dr. Peter Archer, and Kiana Faircloth. Please give them a round of applause. Come on up. Get yourself settled in. Ryan. <laughs> hey, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Jazz Museum in Harlem. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. I'm really excited to be here and chat with the man of the place, the hour, <laughs> 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 the moment, the reason this exhibition is here and on display, Dr. Peter Archer. Give it up for him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joining him, the incredibly multi-talented saxophonist, vocalist, just an amazing spirit and a beautiful person, Camille Thurman. <laughs> and they have a very special connection because, and I learned in our chat before we got up here that Camille was given her very first gig <laughs> by Dr. Peter Archer. She, of course, was his student and has been a mentor to her and really, I'm sure she would agree, is the reason that she is here and flourishing in the way that she is musically today. So thank you both so much for being here. Really excited to get started. <laughs> Let's start with you, Dr. Archer. <laughs> And you enjoyed a 34-year career at the same middle school? Correct. Same for 34 school. years. 34 years in Town of Hawthorne, Middle School 74 in Bayside, Queens. Wow, yeah. incredible. So I'm curious to know how you, like Joe Gardner, <laughs> as you see here, whom you inspired, we'll say. I'm curious to know when you got the call from Disney Pixar looking for an inspirational story how did that all come about in the first place? Well, yes. Well, thanks again for having me. And hello, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Um, well, it was a, a surprising phone call, I <laughs> needless yeah. to say. Um, and once the um, filmmakers, Pete Doctor and Dana Murray, they came and we spoke, and there was just thrill that the, the fit, the connection was just so remarkable. Because um, I have a passion for music, and I develop a love for teaching as well. So mm -hmm. I've managed to um, maintain a dual career as a music teacher and performer. Wow. Well. So like the star of the film, Joe Gardner, he falls into this manhole, <laughs> you know, and he's forced to find himself, his spark. And as you say, you sort of fell into teaching. It's not something that yeah. it sounds like you initially started out mm -hmm. wanting to pursue. So let's talk about that. Sure. Well, it's uh, teaching is something that I shied away from. <laughs> and my passion, my love was strictly to perform. And so what happened was I, um, I had an opportunity to, um, to do an, a music teaching internship and in spite of the fact that it offered a free master's uh, degree okay, it <laughs> and <laughs> a stipend uh, for four semesters I still didn't want to do it um, but the person the professor who initially offered me the opportunity he mentioned that he said you know I think you'll be good at it so when I had a conversation with my mother about this uh, the whole situation and I told her I said I don't want to do this and this professor <laughs> gave me this application, and he said, you know, I think you'll be good at it. Um, so she, in turn, said, well, why did you, have you considered why he said what he said, that you'll be good at it? So that motivated me to just to take the, take the um, accept the uh, position. And to my surprise, I really developed a love for teaching. Mm. And I... Um, as my thinking evolved, I realized how important um, music education is. And um, 
and I really stayed with it for 34 years at my, at my school. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like you had a very supportive mother mm -hmm. and family yeah. unit. Um, so when you were growing up, how were you introduced to the music, and what sparked your wanting to mm -hmm. pursue music for your life, really? Well, um, back in the 60s, 70s, <laughs> I shouldn't mention years, <laughs> but um, yeah. it was, some of you in the audience might know that music was uh, widespread in the elementary schools. Elementary schools had uh, band programs, choral programs, and unfortunately, during the fiscal crisis of the 70s that was taken away. And I remember I was in fourth grade when I heard of a, 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 a band, a school band, <laughs> and I was in awe. And my, my, uh, my eyes glanced towards the back, the trumpet section. And I was just... Um, the jazz band? Yeah, yeah. it was a, a, the symphonic band, school band, school, school symphonic uh, concert band mm -hmm. um, of about 70 kids playing um, in the elementary school in the... Uh, uh, early 70s and so fast forward when I got to seventh grade that was the first time when I I went to my um, band teacher Mr. Sheldon Gardner God bless his soul um, he's the one who really motivated me and inspired me and um, I asked him can I I said can I borrow a trumpet to take home and uh, he did it was a beat up dirty green slimy trumpet with a mouthpiece <laughs> <laughs> and I took the instrument home and really just my siblings, they wanted to throw me out the window. They were so annoyed. And I immediately developed um, a rash, an infection on my lip. Oh my so gosh. my mother as I said, take that thing back to the school, give it to back to the teacher. <laughs> and so, um, but after I was, uh, after the, uh, the healing <laughs> took place, then I, I got back in the school, I got back in band and um, just kept playing trumpet since then. And Loved it ever since. So eventually so you got your own instrument. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brand new. <laughs> clean. <laughs> yeah. But my dad always um, played the uh, all the symphonies uh, mm -hmm. around the house. So I grew up listening to all the Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and I have all of the, the albums still. So we grew up listening to that in the house, and I was always fascinated by the uh, symph symphony. Um, and I was lead trumpet in my high school jazz band. And um, so... I mean, I've so I grew up with uh, different listening to different types of music and, and playing as well. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. you wanted to be an orchestral musician. Correct. Yeah. yeah exactly. Wow. And nothing to do with music education at all. Okay. And um, so, uh, well, we and I've mentioned this to to others that uh, the program that I uh, at Queens College, I was a performance major, and we really. Um, made fun of the uh, music ed majors. <laughs> 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 uh, the only reason why, because we felt that we were the elite and we were the ones who could play. And if you were a music ed major, then you then you couldn't play. Yeah. So little did I, well, my thinking did change. That's funny yeah. that yeah. you guys thought that because yeah. it seems like, you know, music education majors have to know so many different types yes. of instruments to be able to teach on them, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And you ended up having to do that, I'm sure. Absolutely. And it was my mentor, actually. Um, when I started the internship program at Queens College, uh, I remember so very well my first day walking into the uh, middle school. Well, the, the stipulations I should mention for this program was that, A, you were assigned to a middle school, um, and I had to report three days a week. And secondly, I had to report to on campus for a seminar, a music ed seminar. And uh, also I had to observe and, and, observe and contribute something in in the uh, middle school, so when I and my mentor was Tony Soma, <laughs> I should mm -hmm. mention the name. Um, so and he knew that I was not comfortable. That he knew that I didn't, did not want to be there the first day, and I sat in the back and I sat next to Liz Guglielmo, <laughs> tuba player. She's the in charge of New York City Board of Ed uh, Music. So I, s I was I went in the back, sat next to her, and um, so but what. First thing that um, uh, I was thinking about, I said, well, these kids are not jumping off the wall. They're not, they're just very well disciplined, listening to Mr. Solomon. So that just threw me away because I had a, a pre conception uh, of, 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 of uh, teaching. They're they kids, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh huh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but glad they threw me Yeah, but what, what I want to <laughs> say is that um, after, after the, uh, the lesson, so Tony, Mr. Solomon, said, come here. I said, listen, 
this teaching thing is no big deal. Look, you have to know what you're teaching. He said, be consistent with your discipline and learn how to play all the instruments. So that stuck with me. That was very powerful. Wow. Yeah. So Cause. you talked about you having a mentor. Speaking of mentors, let's get to Neil in here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you consider, of course, Dr. Archer your mentor. And <laughs> we were talking before our chat about how you all, how you even found yourself at Nathaniel Hawthorne. Can you talk a little sure. bit about how, you're, how you all met? <laughs> well, I grew up in St. Albans, Queens, and... Um, at the time, well, my mother, she was a school teacher, and at the time, the neighborhood that I was growing up in, it didn't quite have an arts program, and my mother was always looking for different programs to take me, and oftentimes, she had to take me across town mm -hmm. and find places outside of my neighborhood. And I remember she found this school, and I think it's a thing with teachers, they know all the, the secret good public schools to send all their kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's like, I found a school, it's in Bayside, and I was like, Bayside, that's like another country. <laughs> and she's like, it's a good school, it's a great school. All my teacher friends have sent their kids there and they all do great and they all go to great high school, so you're going there. And I was like, uh, I gotta leave my neighborhood again. <laughs> and um, she said, well, they have you know, art, they have uh, drama, they have music. And I was like, okay, this is interesting because most of the schools that I grew up in, they didn't have arts programs. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I did have access to the arts program, it was taken from us. I studied violin for one year in kindergarten, and I remember I had a teacher named Miss Young, and we loved her so much, and then it, we were so sad and heartbroken when we found out the program wouldn't continue. So I was kind of happy about the prospect of being able to have the arts in my school, because I knew it was like to not have it. And she took me there, and I remember the first week of school, they asked, you know, what do you do? Do you have an instrument that you play? And I said, no. But I knew I wanted to go into a music program. And they said, well, you don't play an instrument, so you can't come into the music program. And for me, at 12, well, what was that, like 10, 11 years old, I thought that was kind of weird because it's like, well, if you want to play an instrument, if this is school, school is supposed to teach you. <laughs> and they were telling me no because I didn't come in already with an instrument. And I was very perplexed because I was like, well, I really want to play. But I couldn't play because there was no music in my school. And we had no instruments. So I remember they put me in, in chorus. <laughs> 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 and th there's a lot of irony around this because if you had told me I'd be making a career singing and playing, I would have laughed at your face <laughs> at 10 years old. They put me in chorus and I hated it. <laughs> and I went the first week and I remember we were singing all these songs I'd never heard of. And I remember I went to Mr. Titel and I said, Mr. Titel, with all due respect, this is nothing against you. I think you're a great teacher. I don't want to be here. Can I, can I pick it up from you? Yes, you can. <laughs> uh oh. This <laughs> is like comedy show, though. Yeah. <laughs> so my phone rings. <laughs> so um, I was sharing earlier um, to both of them that um, at, at my school, my beginning classes uh, were 50. I, there were two beginning classes in band. And they were capped at 50. And uh, just to be clear, the arts, uh, band, chorus, and gym um, are, be are allowed to have 50 kids. So I always had the 50 kids. And it helped me with my beginning program in terms of uh, moving the kids along to intermediate band and then uh, to advanced band. So uh, my classes were capped. And the phone rings. Mr. Titel <laughs> says, I have this young little girl. She wants to play the instrument. And I said, he said, will you take her? I said, well, no, I have 50, so I can't take her. And the next thing I heard was a dial tone of the phone. Oh. <laughs> and a knock on the door. <laughs> so I, I went, <laughs> and I went, when I heard the knock, I went to the door. I didn't see any, anyone, so I opened the door, and I looked down. <laughs> and this angel, this little angel, <laughs> I'm like, who are you? She said, I'm Camille from Chorus. <laughs> and she said, um, I said, well, you know, band is full. Um, she says, I, I, I want to play the instruments. Oh, I, I, said, well, <laughs> well, I said, well, come on in. I, I'm not quite sure what I, could, I can do because the class is filled already. So I said, and, and I told her, I said, you know, we've already selected our, our instruments. Um, so I said, well, what would you like to play? She said, trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately looked at her lips. She, there were stitches on, on her lips. And I said, well, you can't play the trumpet. I said, well, what happened to your lips? You said you, you were in a car accident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I said, well, you know, sit at my desk. We'll figure this out. <laughs> so fast forward, she did stay, and I put her on flute, if I recall.
actually trombone. Tr <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before flute, because you wouldn't let me go on a flute. You said, you said, well, look, you can't play trumpet because your lip is busted. <laughs> play trombone, because uh, I need some trombone what? players. Okay, right. So okay. he's like, plus it's a bigger mouthpiece. And he gave me this old busted <laughs> Bundy. <Okay. laughs> and if you know, these instruments have been there since the 70s. So when you open it, it's like 50s, actually, 50s. Coffin and every, yeah, 50 50s. <laughs> And I open the trombone and put it together. I can't even reach sixth position because <laughs> oh. my arms are so short. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, here's a book. Go in the back. Teach yourself some <laughs> positions. And when you're ready, come out so you can start reading. <laughs> and I was just kind of like trying to like change my foot. <laughs> and um, I remember I, I came to class. I think it was like the second week of class or something. And you had us playing in the one of those band method books. And we share trom well, we share instruments throughout the day. So we're assigned an instrument each period. My period was after lunch. And unfortunately, somebody decided to be smart and put a spitball in the trombone. Oh, no. So I'm putting the trombone to my mouth and I'm inhaling, not knowing the spitballs in the, the piping. And it <laughs> went to my lip. And I screamed in the middle of the band <laughs> class. I dropped the trombone and I ran away. I was like, I quit. <laughs> and you were like, what's going on? <laughs> That's one of many stories, by the way. <laughs> so then he was like, what am I going to do? You can't play any other instruments because all the sections are full. I was like, can I please play flute? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking about mentorship, what Camille and a few other students, I mean, she came during her lunch periods every day for the three wow. years at school. Um, her curiosity just fascinated me with the instruments. She wanted to look at the tenor saxophone, the alto sax, the clarinet. The clarinet. So I annoyed you every yeah. day. So, <laughs> but it gave me the opportunity to speak to her and uh, just to um, just broaden her thinking and you know just her and, and, a, few, and a few other students. Uh, so then speaking about you mentioned we mentioned mentorship. Yes. So that was a very important time. Wow. Yeah. 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 He made the space available for me. Because, you know, at lunchtime, I was like, I don't want to hang with the girls. They're just looking at each other, looking cute and whatever. And I want to play. Yeah, and then I remember my mom, she gave me a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And I brought it to you. And I was like, Mr. Archer, is this a clarinet mouthpiece? And you're like, give me that thing. No, <laughs> it's a saxophone mouthpiece. <laughs> and I was like, can I have a saxophone? Oh <laughs> He's like, no, I just gave you a flute two weeks ago. <laughs> but... I loved, you know, that the fact that Dr. Archer took that moment to look at me and see that I was so curious. And he told me, he spoke into my life and said, you know what? Since you're this curious about playing all these instruments, you can actually make a career playing all these instruments on Broadway. And when he told that to me, that just opened my mind. I didn't even know that was possible, mm -hmm. let alone even that you can make a career playing in the pit, playing all these different instruments and having fun. This was something I loved to do and I didn't know that it existed until he told me at like 12 years old. And that was my goal. I want to get to Broadway. Yeah. That's all it takes. Yeah. So <laughs> you brought in the mouthpiece. So when did you actually give her a saxophone? Because that's what you landed on, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I needed a tenor saxophone in the jazz band. Oh, okay. <laughs> you needed a tenor saxophone. Oh, okay. you gave me the alto uh, first. The alto first. <laughs> yeah, it was the alto, so my apology. And I shared with her that, I said, look, um, the flute, the saxophone, and the clarinet that share similarities with the fingerings. And she was fascinated when I showed her. <laughs> and so, yeah, and I needed, we needed an alto in the jazz band, so then I switched her over <laughs> to alto. Got it. <laughs> yep. And then I was able to learn the music really fast, and I moved up. But then you got me into Queens College, because they had a camp, and that's when I switched to tenor, because they Correct. had no tenor saxophone. Right. So fast forward about, what, a year or two, and then he's employing you at your first gig, <laughs> from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as I shared before, my band, uh, we were hired to play out of a uh, function in, in the Poconos every June, last Saturday in June. And I told the guys, I said, you know, this kid in my class, she's very good. I think I want her to sit in with us. You know, so... Wow. They 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 had no idea that you know her capabilities and you know but they were all blown away um, when she came in and sat with us and and I spoke to her mom her mother came with us uh, it was just such a fun weekend that, and I had her back that that next year <laughs> and the year after that <laughs> and the year after that <laughs> really so you had moved on out of Hawthorne mm -hmm. and you were still playing these gigs with him so you guys yeah. stayed in touch yeah oh, okay. Dr Archer was dropping off music books for me to oh. prepare an audition for high school during the summer. 
Yeah. So like even though school was done for the school year, he was still staying in touch with me. Like, okay, you need to work on this for your audition. Okay, you need to practice this. Or even when I got to high school, he was the one that took me to LaGuardia High School. And that was the first time I ever saw a jazz big band high school kids. And I remember I was like, where are we going? He was like, we're going, we're going to see a concert. Don't worry about it. Be quiet. <laughs> and I remember seeing all those kids on stage and they were playing at such a high level. And then there were these two ladies up front playing clarinet and saxophone. Come to find out, I became really close friends with them. They're like my sisters, Lakeisha Benjamin wow. and Kat Rodriguez. Get out of here. So I'm sitting in the audience watching these sisters and I'm like, man, they're ladies. They could play. And he's like, see, they're me. That's going to be you. You're going to be up there next year. <laughs> I didn't even audition or anything. And, and come to find out, I, I did audition and I got into school. And yeah, that was me taking their place. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible, the dedication <laughs> that you okay. saw something in Camille yeah. and you really stuck with her and nurtured her yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mentors are so important. Yeah. And good teachers that actually love mm -hmm. what they do can really make a difference in a kid's life. Mm -hmm. I want to go back a little bit mm -hmm. and talk. You mentioned Gardner being your yeah. mentor, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Did that have anything to do <laughs> with the <laughs> name Joe I'm Gardner, the star? <laughs> well, one of the questions that Pete Dyke asked me who inspired me musically, and it was my middle school band teacher, Mr. Sheldon Gardner, a Juilliard graduate trumpet player. He passed away. Um, that was mentioned. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure. They took a lot of things. So this might have been, who knows. So. I want to know everything. I want to <laughs> know, like, okay, so when you had conversations yeah. with Dr., the director, Pete Doctor. His Pete Doctor is yeah. his name, yeah. um, how did they go? How long was the process of you consulting with them mm -hmm. on your story? And I just want to know how long that process yeah. took for them, for it to become soul. Uh, I would say a span of two and a half or three years. But with me, um, he they came to my school initially. They observed my classroom, they observed my, me uh, teaching, and they took all the measurements with the class. The, uh, the movie starts in my, that's my band room in the opening scene. So, so they but they talked to a lot of different teachers before mm -hmm. they landed on you and wanting to go with your story, right? That was not shared with me. Oh, okay. They just <laughs> I just got the email, <laughs> which I deleted initially. <laughs> Yeah, it was <laughs> very strange. I thought it was spam. <laughs> and it then after the deleted email on a Monday, on a Tuesday, I received a phone call from one of his um, staff personnel. And he s um, the phone rang during my lesson and pick up the phone. The gentleman, he said, I work with Pete Doctor. Pete sent you an email. Pete did not get a response. And <laughs> so that <laughs> that's it just clicked at that point. And then he went, up, you know, he told me that all oh, Peter's doing a movie about a middle school band teacher, and he, he says you're the great fit for the lead character, and so on and so on. But then, um, then we set up a time. They all came came to my school. They observed my class, and then afterwards we went down and we spoke. And they were just, they were very happy. <laughs> we spoke about what makes me tick, my passion, wow. my dual career, um, something. They were they really liked. I'm, I'm a missionary as well. My missionary team we service 500 orphans in Port-au-Prince, and I my job is to uh, make music with 100 100 of 100 kids from the 500. Um, and obviously, COVID has really limited our um, our t uh, team from going and doing our work. But um, and they were just they were impressed with the the uh, the whole idea of um, me realizing that here I was, my passion became an obsession. Um, I just wanted to, I, when I graduated, my next step for me was just to perform in an orchestra. I was preparing for auditions. And then when the whole education thing happened, um, I didn't want it. But then my thinking, my whole outlook changed because I began to realize that, wow, I could help kids find a spark. I could, you know, um, you know, it deal with these kids like Camille Thurman. <laughs> you know, I can help them find their way, help, help them think. And um, so it became less of me. It became mm. just helping others. Mm. So, and that's what the movie is really about, dis discovering as opposed to thinking what we know what's best. So it's a discovery of what's important in life. And that's what happened to me. And they were fascinated um, by incredible. learning that. Yeah. 
you guys have that orchestral connection. So I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about orchestra culture, because as you mentioned, you have been doing some auditioning. What were some of the challenges you were met with in the process of trying yeah. to, you know, make performing your career? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, and my teacher mentioned this to me, but this really didn't, um, I just, he, it's the cultural uh, aspect. So quite frankly, we don't find uh, minorities in the symphony um, orchestras. New York Philharmonic, Anthony McGill is the only <laughs> clarinet player, and so I could I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, it was reality, but I just put that behind my my mind in my I, I didn't really dwell on that, and I just kept on pushing, kept on practicing, and um, preparing my orchestral excerpts. Mm. Yeah, and for you, Camille, of course, being I don't know if you guys realize this, but the first woman in Jazz at Lincoln Center's 30 years of being a full-time, for two seasons, mm -hmm. musician and touring with them, the only woman. I know that must have been challenging for you. I mean, I, I, I think about the experience that I had just starting out with Dr. Archer and how lucky I was to have that seed planted because that's what really kind of helped push me through all the different challenges of being the only woman or being the only black person or being the only black woman <laughs> in situations. And, um, and even experiencing those situations where it's the complete opposite, where you're not wanted. So um, it was really just having Dr. Archer and, and so many other great mentors too that kind of helped foster in me like, no, you can do this. You belong there too just like everybody else, and you can do this too. Even if I didn't have the example to see in front of me that I could identify with or hear or mm. how, how to find, they were just instrumental in just making sure that you, you do it because you can, and you should be able to do it just like everybody else, and you deserve to be there too, just like everybody else is there. Wow, that's incredible, and so beautiful that you had him and others to lean on, mm -hmm. you know, during that time, that had to be, I can't even imagine like being the only, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Wow, incredible. And now you are actually taking up the torch of mentoring too. Let's talk a little bit about Haven Hang. Sure, <laughs> well during the pandemic I, I started a virtual mentorship series called the Haven Hang because um, while I was touring with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, I noticed that I was getting a lot of emails and uh, messages through my social media from young girls and they would ask questions about things or they would say, oh my gosh, I just saw you on a live stream. Just seeing you there was just like, it blew my mind because I had never seen any other woman there. And I thought to myself, man, you know, I remember being their age, 13, 14, 15, and not being able to talk to anybody that I, as a lady, let alone even have somebody to ask those questions <laughs> because I mean, Dr. Archer was great, but there were some, you know, questions that as a lady I couldn't quite ask because I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to create a space where that conversation could be had. And I thought about also at that time we're sitting at home and I was like, man, all these people, all these students are probably sitting home. And I was like, you know, and there's probably a lot of young ladies too sitting home. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create a space where it was safe for them to ask questions, but also at the same time, give them opportunities to see other women that are doing what they might want to do and have that space where they could have dialogue with them and yeah also have those women share their stories so I started the Haven Hang and I asked a couple of my mentors and um, some of my closest friends and sisters to just get on the, the chart with me for an hour and just talk about what is what's it like doing what they do and how do they feel doing it but also talking about the things that they have to face and overcome, and not just developing as a musician, but also developing as a woman, mm -hmm. too, because you find that um, there's things that you have to develop as, a char as, as your own personal character in going through the process of becoming yeah. <laughs> a musician and going through those spaces where you might be the only one and understanding what it really means to stick in there for the sake of you doing it for the love of the music mm -hmm. and also because you have the belief in yourself to do it too. 
Who did you have on for you to speak to Dion? Oh, I had Dee Dee Bridgewater, um, Diane Reeves, uh, Bertha Hope, Jasmine Horn, Maxine Gordon, and of course, uh, a whole bunch of other women too outside of the jazz field, Crystal Torres, and even women in the arts period, Nia Love, um, quite a few women. So it's it's been great. We've had young girls all over the world from Australia and Africa wow. chiming in and watching and sending messages and saying, thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> and you were the spark, I like yeah. to think, <laughs> yeah. for that. And, and that's why mentorship is so important. It really is contagious. Mm -hmm. Because when you've had good mentorship, you want to be that mm -hmm. to someone else. That's incredible. That is so yeah, beautiful. I think the, the gift that keeps on giving. So yeah, I was going to mention that in the age of technology, the kids are, nowadays they're, their heads are in on their cell phones, mm -hmm. <laughs> and just to be able to t speak with them, and um, understand what they're thinking, and just have a conversation with them rather than you know the, the being on social media for right. twenty four hours. And you're yeah, still yeah. mentoring and teaching. You're retired, but yes. but you <laughs> still haven't really stopped. It seems. Well, I s I I'm still doing my private lessons through Zoom, and um, I have my own band then that she performed. <laughs> That she uh, played with us uh, when she was a little girl. Um, we're still active, oh and cool. um, it's now the uh, the catering halls are um, reopening. Uh, COVID restrictions are easing, so we have we're busy now, um, uh, doing weddings and bar mitzvahs and things uh, along okay. that line. So no retiring to Florida for you for a while. Oh. <laughs> 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 he's, still, he's still out here. I was sharing with uh, the lady in the audience, Miss Nia, Miss Faith, <laughs> that. Uh, I was deemed uh, distinguished alumni by Queens College, and they out, they gave me my own li space at the library, mm -hmm. and I'm preparing my collection of research papers, my dissertations over there um, at the Rosenthal Library. <laughs> wow, that's incredible, man. <laughs> this is so fascinating, um, and I, I'm just so excited that Disney and Pixar decided to really get in touch with a real story, mm -hmm. a real teacher and amazing guy like you to bring this story to life how much cons like in the process of consulting mm -hmm. how much of what we're seeing in the movie is actually what you told to the mm -hmm. studio I'm just for instance this guy back here on the drums <laughs> <laughs> we were having a conversation beforehand yeah. about he looks like a lot of different people <laughs> he even looks like Daryl Green a little bit <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> so how much of their story did they actually take and use what are <laughs> that we're seeing in Seoul? Well, again, the conversation was like ex extensive. Was, um, we uh, spoke about, again, um, just my, 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 my life as a teacher, as a musician. Um, I mentioned that in my band, I have my, my former student is, is my drummer. I'm, uh, we really spoke about my passion. So this is your former student. It could be. Oh, it could be. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we mentioned that my performing uh, engagements. We spoke about my teaching styles, the mentorship. Um, we spoke in terms of um, just the importance of helping uh, others. And I mentioned before, um, taking yourself, um, being selfless, and helping others. So that was a uh, key component in our discussion about my what makes me tick, mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea of uh, the importance of teaching young young minds. Wow! Yeah. And you even got a call from the studio as well. Let's talk a little <laughs> bit <laughs> about that and how the you know the pandemic kind of yeah made some things go a different way, but. So I was working with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, and uh, my publicist called me, and she said, I got a call from um, John Batiste's manager. And I said, OK. And she was like, they want to know if you could fly out this weekend to LA to um, do some recording. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to perform in Rose Theater with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra this week. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how that's going to go with Whitney. <laughs> And she was like, well, is there any way you can get out of it? And I was like, well, you know, unfortunately, we already started the week and we were rehearsing, and it'll be too short of a time to get another person in. So I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to decline because <sighs> I know that's I hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. Because <laughs> she was like, this is Pixar. This is Disney. And she was like, they want you to play. I was like, and I was like, I know. And Dr. Archie, he told me about it, too. And I was like, oh, my God, they actually called me to do this. <laughs> 
But um, did you tell them to call me? <laughs> <laughs> he told them to call me. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, you know, I'm doing this film, and he's like, yeah, he said, like, oh yeah, I met Terry Lynn, I met this person, I met that, and, and I knew some of the people there too. So I was just kind of like, wow. And I know John, we had literally just met right before that at um, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Gala. So I was just like, oh man. But I was like, okay, I got to hold my obligation because you know I had to do it and. Of course, I did the gig with, with, with the orchestra, but then um, what ended up happening was, I believe it was a year later almost, they called me and they said, hey, um, are you gonna be in town? Because we still wanna you know, work with you and, and have you play a part in playing with the music. I was like, yeah, sure. And they said, well, we're recording the band um, in New York City. And I was like, okay, I'm in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm free that day. And he was like, great, we'll be in, be in touch. The contract is gonna give you all the paperwork. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, great. This was like a couple of days before we had shut down. <sighs> so two weeks later, once we kind of figured out that the shutdown was gonna be longer than a weekend, he called me back and said, hey, I'm really sorry um, because of the whole situation with the pandemic. We're gonna have to you know, not do the session and they're gonna finish the film's music um, you know, virtually. virtually. So I was just like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so I almost did it, but I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm just grateful and honored that they actually called and that John actually thought of me to, you know, to, to work with him because that was such a huge art. And then just the history of knowing that this film was based off of my music teacher. It just, right. it meant so much to me and it felt just really special that this was being done. And of course, I was just so ecstatic for him. And then I was very happy to know that my big sister, Tia Fuller, ended yeah. up getting <laughs> to do I it, mean, so. It, it she's incredible. Yeah. Right, so. <laughs> yeah. Wow, amazing. So John Batiste, of course, is, he mocks the piano. All the fingers are, mm -hmm. I guess, modeled Those after are John's hands. John Batiste. <laughs> Such long fingers, they are. And he ended up winning the Oscar for that. Did you have any hand in choosing who was playing what, or how much of, how how involved were you in the process of them casting? I guess for right. this. So I was not part of that okay. at all. I was strictly the the middle school band teacher perspective. I got it. Yeah. Okay. So that was I a was separate. Uh, I was curious. To know yeah. yeah. Um, Pixar works in different in teams, mm -hmm. even with the uh, movie. Um, there's a legal team, the production team, and so on. And um, so we so he was. I was not part of that. The uh, uh, music uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent choice, though, and John Baptiste. And of course, he's blown up. How many Grammys did he win? Five. Five Grammys and Oscar. On yeah. Gap commercials now. He, he's <laughs> like on a rocket ship at this yep. point. So and he's doing an orchestral piece now that he's going to be performing mm -hmm. this Wednesday. No, this Saturday at Carnegie Hall. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> you guys are incredible. <laughs> you really are. And I'm not sure if we can take any questions, but if you have any, okay, we can. If you have any questions for Dr. Peter Archer, Camille Thurman, definitely feel free to ask. We are so happy that you're here. And um, we were worried for a minute that <laughs> y'all weren't going to be here, but I'm so glad you showed up. <laughs> and for all of you online, thank you, of course, for joining us. And yeah, yes. Yes, I was told it was the most uh, streamed vid uh, movie ever. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. <laughs> and speaking of the opening, of course, that was postponed. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to happen, you June, said? June uh, 2020, June 19th. That was the original release date. And then it didn't end up happening until Christmas. Right. So you all did a virtual. I want to say that was probably one of the first of yes. its kind that I had heard of, a virtual opening of a movie. Mm -hmm. How did that go? Uh, well, we did a virtual red carpet. And uh, there was a preview, a virtual preview of, of just uh, selected people. <laughs> Put it that way. Prior, mm -hmm. prior to the actual Christmas Day um, release. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. It went well. It, went well. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little fun. <laughs> Anybody, if you have any questions, for sure, you can ask. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Would you be open to that if you were asked to contribute sure. to your story? Sure. Wow. Sure. Oh, you got a lot of stories, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 stories oh, about Camille. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, speaking of stories, I know you got a lot of them. Because y'all been, you know, hanging in pretty tight for a few years. What's, what's a very funny story about Camille? Oh, boy. About <laughs> and then I'll ask <laughs> on the other side. Well, I gave you the initial <laughs> story, that how we met. The f that, that was It was a funny moment, um, but... I did realize that she really wanted to be in the class, and my numbers were over, and I had to speak to the administration and make an exception for her. But I do recall <laughs> during class lesson, and we were about to start, and I looked down, and I didn't see Camille at her seat. So I, I asked the classmate, I said, where's Camille? She said, oh, she's in the back messing with the instruments. So here she comes dragging, well, actually, I saw the, the baritone saxophone moving by itself, I realized she was behind it. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she said, Miss Harsha, can I, can I play this? Can I play this? <laughs> and the class was just, it was, it was a hysterical moment. Needless oh. to say, <laughs> she was fascinated by the baritone saxophone, just was, you know, was much taller than she was. That's so cute. That's <laughs> remember so that cute. I remember that. that. silver <laughs> baritone saxophone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that thing was heavy, too. <laughs> I was thinking, so you could have waited until lunchtime. You're, the, lunch, you're in my room every day at lunch, <laughs> but she chose her in the class lesson, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Do you have a story about that? <laughs> oh man, I, <laughs> I'm try okay. I have a story. So I remember I would come and hang out at Doctor's Archer's um, classroom every day during lunch period to practice and to try out different instruments. And I remember um, I think it was a security guard by the name of John. He would come so downstairs and hang out too, and he played piano. I didn't even know he played piano. So he would come and play and practice, and they would be talking and whatnot. And I remember the buzzer went off. And I was like, oh my gosh, that A flat sounds terrible. And they're looking at me like, you don't have an instrument in your hand. H how do you know that's A flat? <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's just A flat. And they're looking like, yeah, but how do you know you have no reference? <laughs> There's no instrument with you and you just kind of just knew. And I was like, well, it's very, it has that weird rub and it's really bothering me. And they were like, why? And I was like, well, cause it's like really making me feel uncomfortable cause I can hear the rubbing of the notes. So then John walks to the piano, and he sits down, and he starts plucking notes. And he's like, name that. I'm like, oh, that's B. Pluck that. OK, that's a D flat. OK, let me go up here. Oh, that's an F. Mm -hmm. That's a G sharp. And John and him are like looking at each other like, do you know what you have? And I was like, no, it's just I hear stuff, and it's weird. And they're like, you have perfect pitch. I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, perfect pitch is the ability for you to be able to hear something and know the name. I'm like, oh, that's what that is. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, how long have you known you had this? And I was like, well, I think I've had it since I was a kid, but I just didn't know names for it. I just knew colors for it. <laughs> so oh. then they were like. <laughs> I think that's a thing. It's called synesthesia. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So they were just looking at each other like, you have perfect pitch. But then that's how Dr. Archer figured out I wasn't reading the music. Because when I came to band, oh. <laughs> I was playing the chart, but playing yeah. I was playing it all by ear. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> had you run across any other students that had perfect pitch like that? Yeah, there were, I mean, it's 34 years at my school, and um, there were um, um, a lot of students. I mean, I mean, it was such a really joy, and just you know, besides her, there were others were very special, and they are in the profession as well. You can name them if you'd like. Josh Holcomb, <laughs> Carl Bartlett Jr., <laughs> wow. Zachary Hahn, uh, Norman, Norman Edwards. Norman Edwards. <laughs> 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so got to make you so proud. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sure it feels like your babies, you know, are out yeah. there in the world. Your, your musical offspring, I'm yeah. sure it feels yeah. like your reach is so much greater that you chose the teaching profession. Yeah. And I remember when she told me that she got a contract with Linton, and she invited me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I surprised them. <laughs> I said, um, Dr. Archer, what are you doing? I think it was a Saturday night. Uh, or s Saturday during the day. I was like, what are you doing during Saturday? And he was like, uh, I, got, I got some gigs because it's the holidays because he does a trumpet thing every year. 
for Christmas Eve. And I said, well, can you come, you know, the next day? And he's like, yeah, I could be there. And I said, okay, I'm going to get you a ticket. I'll put your name at the box office. And he's like, okay. So I didn't tell him. I just told him, like, oh, you know, you're just performing a show. He came. He saw the show. And then I brought him backstage. <laughs> and, you know, if you go to Jazz at Lincoln Center, it's these big white doors that lead you to the backstage. And I brought him to my case, which is, like, humongous <laughs> and I opened it up and I showed him all my instruments my bass flute my alto flute my clarinet my tenor and my my regular flute and I said Dr. Archer I'm here on Broadway because of you thank you for <laughs> bringing me to this point <laughs> very touching very emotional oh my god that was beautiful so many good memories too many <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, I kind of grouped them in families, so there's three families, but if you had to individually, about seven, or oh, eight if you include the voice. Yeah. yeah. Certainly divine you. timing. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, did you do that every year? Did you bend the rules <laughs> every year? No, she was an exception. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Dr. Archer, you've yes, done sir. a lot of theater with the education system yes. and, and how our system is funded for the parents that are listening and being so inspired by the show and your, your children are involved in music here. Uh, what would you say to them Well, they, they, they shouldn't give up, and they should encourage, it, encourage their children uh, to, um, to do music. Um, there's, there's setbacks, setbacks in terms of lack of funding, lack of instruments, but I, I don't think they should allow that to um, distract or discourage them. But um, I've always pushed my, chil my students, uh, no matter what the obstacles may be, so I would encourage the parents to do the same. I would say the same thing too. My mother, she was a, a school teacher herself, so she knew firsthand as a teacher and as a parent what her, her students and what I was dealing with as far as not having access, which was very, very um, hard. And I, I witnessed my mom almost even being in tears c trying to like get me into programs and say, I don't understand why it has to come down to a zip code allowing a kid to have access or not have access to these programs. And even if when it came down to getting instruments in the hands, um, it was a fight. So if my mom had not submitted that variance for me to cross town and go to school 45, 50 minutes away from home, I would have never met Mr. Archer. I would have never had an instrument in my hand. So I, I would say, please keep fighting. Find every and any opportunity, any and every way to, um, to, to get your kids to have that experience because um, it's worth the fight. I, it really is. And I mean, he's one of the angels that exists in the system that was designed to not always help others. And he was right there at the time when I needed it, exactly at 12 years old, and literally gave me my instruments all the way up until, all the way through high school. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody give Dr. Archer a hand and Camille Thurman. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been incredible. I'm not sure how we're doing on time here. Yes, you have a question.
<laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> That's <I> beautiful. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Oh, Bill Saxon, awesome. please, <laughs> please give him a hand. <laughs> Bill Saxon was one of the main people when I first got out of college and came back to the city out of school um, and spent time with me. Even when I didn't have the money at like 25, 26 years old to pay for lessons, he took the time to sit with me and show me this music and teach me my culture's history, literally the lineage of playing the tenor saxophone and this music from Frank Foster and so many others. And I'm, I, I love you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Kiana Faircloth, everybody. I thank you, Ryan, for having me. Ryan Maloney, everybody. And I'm sure you can follow uh, the National Jazz Museum here in Harlem at National Museum Jazz Museum. NATL Jazz Museum on the socials. And become a member. I'm sure you're always looking for members. <laughs> it's important that you support, you know, support entities such as this so that, you know, they can host conversations where the community can come in and recognize the importance of the arts and how we can pass on this love and interest to the next generation. So it starts with supporting organizations such as this. So definitely go online, National Jazz Museum dot org yes got it thank you thank you, yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> dr peter archer camille thurman tell us where we can follow you and keep up with you and everything sure you, you can follow me on instagram at camille thurman or facebook camille thurman music i'll actually be performing here um, in new york city june 3rd and 4th uh, at the Appel Room downtown in uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center. So if you're in New York City, come through. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Archer, if, if folks want lessons, I don't know if you're accepting students <laughs> at that time. I don't know if you want to give it out to the, <laughs> to the internet, but if you it's do. It's PT Trumpety at AOL. Okay. PT Trumpety. Y'all heard that. Okay. Not all at once, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> all right, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all were so easy to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Those stories, I'm telling you, they're so great in my head. Man. <laughs>